so I'm just going to split the pack slid and bolt it up tight so it doesn't matter. Yet sack reconstruction was taking shape in the museum as the volunteers met in May for their usual update. Peter Lawrence actually used the original Ed Sack. Looking familiar. They took time off for a group photograph right. to match the at, posed I photos of Morris Wilkes and the other tweed jacketed pioneers in 1949. There's a, a lot happened. There is now a, a power control cabinet and wires coming out of it, and indeed wires running around to the machine. Um, so we're getting to the point where hopefully people can start plugging things in and testing them. That's why I've asked Alex to talk first about the design of the power control system, um, how it operates, and basically that, that conversation I hope will end up with a, so how do I plug my chassis in then and what can I do and when can I do it, so that we can begin um, that regime of, of getting things working in the racks. Uh, the machine switch. needs a variety of power yeah, supplies. Alex control. Passmore is in charge of the power uh, distribution. The emergency stop button, which works with all the, the red buttons around the room and a, a emergency stop reset. Uh, next is the heater on off, push buttons for off and on, similarly for HT. Oh, I've just had a horrible thought that we've missed out. Shouldn't we have had an hour meter? Yes. Is there any reason why we can't put one in now at the end then? It could be that we will want to log things like valve hours. Yes. Mm. It's possible. Uh, on the baby, we've done it by going through the logbook and looking at any, you know, it's switched on at 10 o'clock and off at 2. And it's a bit tedious and yes. really hit and miss. Um, because of, yeah. So it's a possibility that we ought to have both um, <coughs> heaters on and an HT on. Okay, so we've we, two hour meters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Later, another photo opportunity celebrates a recent discovery. The EDSAC replica work has depended on the interpretation of photographs, notebooks, sketches, incomplete circuit diagrams from the 1940s, and one or two physical remnants assumed to be from the original machine. But in the last few months, there's been a new discovery, complete circuit diagrams found by John Loker, a retired engineer from the University Mathematical Laboratory. They're dated. They all date um, from the later life of the machine, um, which again is why one needs to be a little careful with interpreting them. Yeah. John um, worked with Ed Sack's successor, group. Ed Sack II. There's about six of us um, keeping the Ed Sack II running and also. Fortunately, John is a self confessed hoarder. Ed Sack I, it had gone the June the year before. I'd like to have seen it, but. It's been cleared out, but they hadn't cleared out all the cupboards. And on clearing out, that's where I come across those. The dates and significance of these circuit diagrams suggest a late and modified version of EDSAC, but they're still incredibly valuable. I'm wondering if you know, part of this was the ongoing relationship with Lyons and Leo. That you know, Leo said, why don't we get some proper drawings made? Um, there's inconsistency between the signal coming out of the gates, uh, whether it's DC coupled or AC coupled, to the cathode folio, follower. Um, so sometimes they were, and sometimes they weren't. The discussions around the newly discovered plans gives us a glimpse of the kind of forensic analysis which has been a key part of the EDSAC reconstruction project. So we'll eavesdrop on a few minutes of the discussion. The first point is the one which pervades all these drawings and the introduction of these long tail cathode followers. Um, John P has done some investigations on these. These, these, these are used extensively. It's a, it seems to provide less signal loss. When uh, in one of the documents it said that Rennick spent all his time tweaking the circuitry I can well believe that this is the one of the things he said at some stage that when they got to May 49 and it worked, he said, oh yes, but only by the skin of its teeth, we've got to do something about improving the signal levels. And we know we get a loss, a loss of signal levels. And his radical approach was to do this. Why does, well, universally, they uh, use a common 100 ohm 
stopper on the anode and they route the high tension screen through that as well. This expertise comes yeah. from an almost lost generation of engineers who still understand the intricacies of valve technology and can interpret these circuit diagrams. Uh, the next very interesting thing is there is much less high tension decoupling on this, this chassis compared with the original. Now the original chassis, which is in the display case over there, has got HT decoupling on every valve, indi individual HT decoupling on every valve. And that takes up the bulk of the visible components you see on the tag strips. Um, in, in this version, uh, there's decoupling on two valves. All the rest goes straight to HT. So all these, a lot of things which are make nicer, cleaner, larger signals. These later changes in the machine may have improved its performance, but should they be incorporated in the replica? A line has to be drawn somewhere. A little bit later than our um, target date. Yeah, we're sort of targeting March 51. Exactly. So um, I'm assuming that we may note some of these issues and take advantage of them if we need to, but we're not going to make a wholesale change. Yeah. So that suggests the chassis, uh, the panel ones that ended up in museums, of which we got the sample here, may well have been throwaways that weren't, modi weren't modified. Very good. Very good. Okay, very good. Um, so we'll, we'll come back I think, and talk on mass about what we might adopt as changes and things. So let's get all the things out on the table. Nigel Sorry. Benny is convinced that one change in the design definitely needs adopting. One of the interesting things amongst these 20 uh, new diagrams that were found is the first four revisions only go up to September 1949. So it's pretty certain that most of that diagram is original. This is very significant because we're trying to uh, make a replica of the machine of that era. They were finally revised, this particular one, in 1953, but the important element about it is the circuit is recognisable. These are recognisable circuits that we were already building in. What's new is that they, on every pulse amplifier, they use two semiconductor diodes, like this. That's a semiconductor diode. My contention is that every pulse amplifier in all the circuits, in all those diagrams we've got, all have these diodes fitted. So I think it was a pretty major design decision that was made early on. So we're using that. There are many diodes in EDSAC. This valve here is the oldest and worst performance of them all. There are many other smaller, more modern diodes. The EA50, which is a much better performance diode, but of similar age. And then there's the semiconductor diode, which we've been describing, um, which is much, much better performance than either of those two and doesn't use any power at all. In implementing it on the half adder that we've already got, adding four diodes to this, improves the performance unbelievably. The reliability is a big improvement. One other thing to point out here is it's not just in the pulse amplifiers, in the OR gates where you've got a lot of inputs to an OR gate. The basic thermionic valves have relatively high resistance these have got a 300 ohm resistance, these have got 3000 ohm resistance, so they're not as efficient as these that have about 10 ohms resistance. So the fact that they're using, where you've got six diodes required, they're using semiconductor diodes, I think is very significant, and I think we're not cheating by using those in our model.